I got to tell you, this uh, this daylight savings time thing has to go. Uh, yeah. Why have we gotten rid I, of it? We I don't, don't know it. why there is a daylight saving. I'll tell you what. This is what it was. Because every day, there's, still, there's places in the United States now that do not have daylight savings time. But daylight savings time was, was started by the government under two fallacies. The first one being that it would somehow save you money because you wouldn't have to have your electricity on as much because we're going to save and conserve the daylight. And that has been totally and completely debunked. They've done studies out of California and daylight savings time and other places. It's like 0.01% savings on energy uh, during the daylight savings period. Makes absolutely no. And the other one was so that farmers could have more time to work, which is perhaps the stupidest. I can, I can get over the, the, the idea that maybe you might want to save money and you wanted to test out the theory. But this idea that farmers somehow work off a clock is, is ridiculous. They work off the sun. Yeah. It's like, oh, if the sun's getting up sooner, guess what? So do I. <laughs> and if, I, if the sun stays out in the day longer, guess what? I, I work later. There's no this, this idea that some farmers like oh well, you know it's getting you know the sun's coming up a little bit earlier but it's I don't get up till seven so <laughs> it's the stupidest thing it had to be started from somebody in Washington because they're the only ones who don't know how farmers actually operate but anyway and it, it's just one more example of a government program that once started you just you have it's like pulling teeth to kill it and so every year. The same time, I lose an hour of sleep a night, and I come in dragging myself in the morning on Sunday morning, trying to get everybody together and get out the door. Then you spend two weeks trying to get your yeah, kids to back get, on schedule. Yeah, trying to get back. The kids are, yeah. Oh, man. Anyway, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Jason Stapleton Program, broadcasting from the Random Walk Studios deep in the heart of America, and I'm very glad that you're back here joining us for another exciting excursion into the world of politics and economics and liberty. And if this is the first time that you're joining us on the show today, you're in for a real treat because uh, I'm going to knock your socks off today. But I want to, for those of you who were, uh, who've been concerned, I want to put your minds at ease. Apparently, the University of Irvine has reversed its policy, its no-flag policy, on the campus. And so you can rest easy that patriotism is strong and proud at UC Irvine in California. Now, for those of you who are saying, what? UC Irvine banned the they flag? Banned the flag? Surely they didn't ban the flag. Really? They wouldn't. At a, at a state college? At a government-funded and, and taxpayer-funded college? Can they do that? Well, it turns out, yes, they can. This was all started in this big to-do when the student body decided that it wasn't going to allow the American flag to be hung in certain community places throughout the college. The actual, uh, the actual group that did it, with, or the, the actual individual who, who wrote this, was Matthew Guevara, a student at the School of Social Ecology. Now, I'm not entirely sure what social ecology is, but I guarantee you, unless the government's paying him, he's not going to have a job when he graduates. Because <laughs> nobody pays you for a social ecology degree. So congratulations, you're either going to be going back to the college, Matthew, in order to try and get your Ph.D. and then work and teach social ecology to a bunch of other young uh, minds full of mush or some government is going to hire you in order to help make them more socially, uh, I, I don't know, aware. But he said, and I quote, that this, is, this doesn't make, first of all, this is not going to make sense to you, okay, because it doesn't make sense. But I want to read to you, this is what he planned and wrote down. This is how bad it is. He actually took the time to write this down and then, and then submitted it. He said, designing a culturally inclusive space aims to remove barriers that create undue effort and separation by planning and designing space to enable everyone to participate equally and confidently. Now, I don't know what a culturally inclusive space is, nor do I know, nor do I understand how it creates barriers of effort and separation. That, let me read it to you again, and maybe so one of you can send me a note on Twitter, at Jason underscore Stapleton. That comes to my desk here. You can email me, Jason at 
theliveshow.tv. Maybe you can explain this. I need someone with a degree of with uh, of social ecology or just a, a huge progressive to send me a note and explain this to me. Designing a culturally inclusive space aims to remove barriers that create undue effort and separation because we can't have undue effort. <laughs> can't have it. By planning and designing space that enables everyone to participate equally and confidently. The resolution continues. An American flag has been flown in instances of colonialism and imperialism. Flags not only serve as a symbol of patriotism or weapons of nationalism, but also construct cultural method, uh, mythologies and narratives that in turn, uh, na- and that in, that turn, ch- in turn charge national, uh, nationalistic sentiments. So, oh, this is so hard. This is, you know what this is? This is a 20-year-old kid trying to sound smart. That's what this is. But he says the flag, he, he incorporates patriotism and, and, and bundles that up alongside weapons for nationalism. So he says the flag not only serves as a symbol of patriotism or weapons of nationalism, because nationalism is a terrible thing. I guarantee you this guy's in favor of national socialism. But nationalism, when you're talking about freedom and liberty, is a terrible thing. He says the resolution noted that certain spaces, the resolution noted that in certain spaces, freedom of speech can be interpreted as hate speech. Well, um, Matthew, I hate to break it to you, son, but hate speech is free speech. The reason that we have free speech is so buffoons like you can come out and write crap like this and not be put in prison for it and not be shot on sight. Okay? Someone should send you back to grade school. Because not only does this not even make sense when I read it, you don't even understand what free speech is. It is designed to protect offensive speech. Freedom of speech doesn't exist so that you can say what you want as long as it doesn't offend anybody. So that it doesn't make anybody angry. So as long as everybody agrees with it, you can say it. Freedom of speech exists to protect hate speech, to protect speech against the government so that people can say and do what they want without having to worry about the reprisal of the government. But here's a young future politician, Matthew Guerra, Guerra, University of California and Irvine, social psychology degree soon to be. He's involved in student government, learning the way government works. And the first thing that he wants to do is outlaw some forms of speech. Because some free speech could be construed as hate speech. I'm just, I love California. Let me ask you all out there in California, because we're on the radio in California. What do you guys feel about this? How do you feel? Because where does, where does a Matthew Guevara come up with this crap? Do you think he's dreaming up words like uh, imperialism and colonialism on his own? You think he's out there Googling that stuff and studying colonialism so that he really understands what it is? No, he's not doing that. That guy's watching Snooky videos. He's watching the real housewives of Orange County. That guy has absolutely no clue. Where he's learning that stuff is in the halls of higher education. He's learning about the evils of American colonialism, their imperialism, their empire building around the world. And folks, don't get me wrong. I got a big problem with this, you know, perpetual war that we're involved with. I've spoken about that many times. But he's not learning this stuff on his own. No, no, no. You got to go to a state-funded school to learn how evil America is. You got to be receiving a tax-subsidized education at a state school in order to learn just how evil and rancid 
America is. And if you live out there in California, how do you feel about this? Hmm? Hmm? Does it bother you even in the least? I really don't know. When I lived in California, I lived in 29 Palms. I lived out of McCaxie, the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center. 29 Palms is a basically a, <laughs> it's basically a meth town. <laughs> it's a tiny little hole in the wall where it, people pass through, and everybody who works there in some way is associated with uh, providing for the military base in some form or fashion. There's just there isn't a lot out there other than that. So I never lived in L.A. I never lived in uh, Riverside or Loma Linda, where uh, where we broadcast from in California. Never lived in Riverside, Rancho Cucamonga. Never lived in San Francisco. I've been to San Francisco. San Francisco, I thought was uh, when I was there, was a pretty nice place. It just uh, just a lot of homeless people walking around. They just there's <laughs> like homeless people can go pretty much wherever they want to in in San Francisco. So other than having, you know, some wanting to cross the street every other minute to, you know, to avoid somebody, uh, it wasn't really that bad of a place, I didn't think. Of course, they didn't know my politics either. But I, uh, I wonder how you guys really feel about this. Does it bother you that uh, your children are being indoctrinated into a, a belief system that teaches them and trains them to hate liberty. Because he's talking about imperialism and he's talking about colonialism. What he's really talking about are, are the folks inside his institution that are teaching him that everything about America is bad. The way we grew up, the way we were founded, slavery, civil rights, our wars of oppression, that America is evil and that he needs to take a stand. Matthew needs to take a stand. The school needs to take a stand because there's no way that we would be able to come together as a people as long as the American flag flies because the American flag doesn't stand for liberty in Matthew's mind. The American flag doesn't stand for unity. It doesn't stand as a beacon on a hill as a shining light that says, come here and be free. If you come here, you can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. You can achieve. No one is going to hold you back. That's not what his America stands for because that's not what he's been taught America is. And folks, slowly but surely, America is straying farther and farther away from that. It's very, very difficult to say that we're now the America where anyone can come and where you can be free and you can, uh, where, where the, 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 the tenets of liberty, this concept of libertarianism, the right to be left alone, these things are slipping further and further from our fingers due in large part to the fact that Matthew is going to this uh, University of California and receiving an education and an indoctrination into a belief that teaches him to hate America, to hate what we stand for. And folks, if we don't start teaching our children, my daughter asked me yesterday why we pay taxes. Oh, I wish I would have fly on the wall. <laughs> it was a difficult conversation to have with her at such a young age. My daughter is seven. But I talked with her about it. And as they get older, I'm going to share with them, and we're going to do everything we can to combat the constant influx of, uh, of, uh, of progressivism that pervades American culture. But some of you guys are waking up. Some of you guys are, are America is waking up. I don't mean you guys, because I know that you guys are awake. I know that you, I know that you guys see what's going on. That's why you listen to this show every day. You come here to be empowered. My goal is to empower you. My goal is not to come here every day and teach you a bunch of bad news and to, and to share with you all the terrible things that are going on in the world so that you leave with a sense of hopelessness. 
No, University of Irvine did the right thing. There are people on their, on their school board, namely the student government president, who said, our campus is, a patri is patriotic and proud. We did something right for our campus in reversing what Matthew tried to do. There is hope, ladies and gentlemen. It all is not lost. I will not create a show where we come in every day and we talk about how, you know, life is about ready to end. The sky is falling. Prepare yourself. That's not what this show is going to be about. But this goes directly to the education system that you are paying for if you live in California. And it goes directly to, at its very foundation, what we're teaching our children how we're educating them, how involved we are with that education. i got to tell you guys, I do not like, I would much prefer if my kids went to school, the school taught them, they sent me back home, and they just learned reading, writing, and arithmetic, and it, was, it all just went great. And that was one part of my life that I didn't have to worry about because I had the utmost confidence in the education system. My kids do not attend public school. And even though they don't attend public school, I still watch them like a hawk. Not only that, but in order for my kids to attend the school that they attend, I have to help them with homework. I don't, I don't have a choice. Like, it's required of me if I'm going to put my kids in that school that when they come home, they have parent-assisted homework. It's stuff that we have to do together, and I have to sign off on it. It's stuff they can't do alone. And I am still intimately involved with it because I know they got my kids eight hours a day. I got them like three from the time they get home until they go to bed at night. Who do you think is going to have a greater influence on them if I allow it? You can't fight that as they get older and as they start to go through the system. So you have to be diligent. You have to be on it. Otherwise, you end up with Matthew, Matthew Guevara's instead of this other guy, President Reza Zamorodian. And guys, I just pray that we see more of this. We see more people standing up and saying, look, this is America is not evil. This is not an evil place. This is a great place. The principles and the ideas that we were founded on, this idea of limited government, of the, the, the rights of the individual, the right to be left alone, these are foundational. They've created the greatest society we have ever known, and that is something to be proud of. And people are starting to get it i got to take a break. When I get back, we're going to talk a little bit about Obama. You won't believe what he's saying now about when he learned. You guys are going to guess. But when do you think Obama learned about the email scandal that's now plaguing the Secretary, former Secretary of State Clinton? We'll find out. We'll talk about it when we get back. Stick around. When I first think about the John Locke Foundation, the first thing that comes to mind is the fact that for 25 years, they have been effectively representing freedom, liberty, and the best interests of the American people. Newspapers are fading, and, and investigative reporting has uh, uh, been fading with it, but not in North Carolina because of the John Locke Foundation. As a reporter, when I want to find out what's going on in North Carolina, I look to the John Locke Foundation. People know that the John Locke Foundation is the gold standard of state-based think tanks. Anyone who's interested in policy needs facts to back up what they advocate. We all have feelings, but you actually need to have something to ground that in. And so a place like the John Locke Foundation can offer that. John Locke himself once said, the improvement of understanding is for two ends. First, our own increase of knowledge. Secondly, to enable us to deliver that knowledge to others, something well demonstrated by the John Locke Foundation's mission, 
You know, what's important uh, to remember about the John Locke Foundation is the vision that Art Pope had 25 years ago, to have a conservative state think tank that does solid research and has an impact on the state politically and in other ways as well. Without the John Locke Foundation, a lot of the positive changes that have come about in North Carolina simply would not have been thought of, would never have happened. It's helped uh, North Carolina uh, emerge as a more conservative state than most people expected. It's focus on developing a much better understanding of free enterprise, of the importance of the family, of the key role that community plays. It's really central both to the better, healthy development of North Carolina, but frankly, to conservatives all over America. In a free society, if you want people to change the direction of their government, you need to give them reasons. And the John Locke Foundation gives people facts and reasons and arguments and turns every citizen into somebody making progress for liberty. Congratulations. 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 Congratulations to the John Locke Foundation on 25 years. On your 25th anniversary. Of a whole quarter of a century doing good work. Of leadership. Of helping make America better. Here's to 25 more. Government overreach is the problem. Common Core is the weapon. And your kids are in the crosshairs. Quietly implemented into textbooks and curricula for years, parents are now aware of the dangers of Common Core. But there are alternatives. Freedom Project Education stands proudly against Common Core. FPE is a private, classical, online school for students in kindergarten through high school, built firmly on Judeo-Christian foundations. Freedom Project Education, teaching students how to think, not what to think. What you're witnessing is the truth, unfiltered and unashamed. This is the Jason Stapleton Program. Hey, welcome back, everyone. If you missed any part of the show, go to iTunes, go to Stitcher, go to uh, jasonstapleton.com, go to YouTube. I don't care where you go. I should probably narrow it down and just say go to iTunes. Because iTunes, for what we're doing, is really what matters in terms of uh, gaining our exposure and our credibility on the interwebs. Now, of course, we're on the radio, and, uh, and we're doing a lot of other promotion, but in order to see, help me see the growth of what's happening, I need you to go to iTunes. I need you to subscribe to the show, and if you are willing, if you love the show, leave me a, uh, leave me a rating and leave me a review because that helps me immensely in promoting the show and saying, hey, look, you see, we've got nearly 100 people who have ranked and who love this show. And we're getting, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of downloads every single month. And we, we you know, we're, we're happening. We're moving. And that's the way I can do it. That's the way I can show it. So please go there and download. Give me a rating and a review. And then download and listen to the show every single day so you can stay informed and empowered about what's going on in the world around you. Now, during the break, we were talking in the first segment about Obamacare and about the, just the, the massive massive cabal that that program now is and Darren you, Darren was updating me on his current situation and what's happening with with his struggles with Obamacare but go ahead and don't give us any backstory with it but with all the other problems that you've had with actually getting insurance yeah. but talk to me you recently had a baby yep and now you got to get the baby on an insurance plan that's so right. take us from there and share with me what happened yeah so February we had a baby it means we it's time to get a new insurance plan at her on so basically we, we qualify under the Obamacare exchange for a special enrollment period where you can go in, go to the website, go into my account, basically what, instead of just adding her to a plan, you have to create a whole new application with all of your information that they already have, but you gotta do it again anyway. Add the new baby to the, to the application and they show you what plans you qualify for, mm -hmm. right? So my wife stays on the same plan, I change my plan up a little bit, add the baby to the plan, and then we submit the application. Perfect, great. All right, so everything should be good, right? Well, the following week, my wife goes into the chiropractor and gets her work done, and then they say, okay, you know, it'll be $150 for today. First of all, what kind of chiropractor charges $150 for a visit? Because you said that in the back of my mind, like, I'll go to the—I I pay cash for, for my visits to the chiropractor, and it's normally around 50 bucks to get yeah. an adjustment. 
So your your chiropractor's four times as expensive. Top, top notch. Three times. Okay. Yeah, they, they yeah. Deal he's so much better. <laughs> they deal specifically with uh, pregnant women. Oh, oh, okay. Well, all right. So, so because you're pregnant, I yeah, get that. Anyway, so one hundred fifty dollars. Well, that doesn't make any sense because you know we had already hit our deductible for the year. Because with, you just had the you baby. Just had the baby. Right. right so the right. deductible's met. Right. Yeah. So that doesn't make any sense. So we call up the health insurance. They said, well. Yeah, the issue is that when you submitted the new application, it actually created a brand new account, so you have to start your deductible all over again. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why, why would I do that? If I've already hit a deductible by February in the year, I've got the rest of the year where she can get coverage and I won't have to pay anything, why would I want to start a brand new plan all over again? Well, the point is, is that you didn't even have the option. You had yeah. to create a new, that's what it required under exactly. the exchange. Yeah, exactly. So it's just been a huge mess. And we've talked about it before. This is like the fourth time I've dealt with something just absolutely ridiculous, but it's just the next step in the process. Yep. Well, anyway, it's, yeah, it's just, it's more proof and more evidence that the government cannot run anything efficiently. And I'm not suggesting to you, do not get me wrong, all of you Nazis out there who want to cry and complain about insurance companies. I am not trying to tell you that insurance companies are great and that they don't, that, you know, they don't run scams and that they don't try and keep from paying out on policies. What I am suggesting to you is at least you have some recourse with a private company. You can take them to court. You can create a lawsuit, a, a multi-million dollar lawsuit, and take them to task. And there are uh, organizations and, and, uh, and law, law, law firms that specialize in doing just that, creating class actions, going after people who are trying to basically strip you of your insurance and trying to make your life a living hell. You want to know who you can't go after is the government. You are not big enough, you are not strong enough, and there is no law firm that is going to be able to sue the federal government to get you your money when they end up screwing you over. And it always makes me, it always frustrates me with people who rail against corporate cronyism and corporations and how they're evil and they're screwing over the people and how they've got to be stopped, but they never look at government. They never discuss that government is the largest and most powerful corporation in the world. It is the corporation that has the ability to compel you whether you want to or not. If a company screws you over, if a company doesn't provide you the benefit or the service that it's promised you, you have legal recourse or you can simply vote with your dollars and simply say, I'm not buying another thing from that store. It's like Old Navy. When they had the crummy commercials out, the commercials that just made me sick to my stomach, I said, we're not buying anything from Old Navy until they change their commercials. I know it's petty. I know it is. But the point is, I can vote with my dollars. I can simply say their, their commercials are juvenile. They reduce my intelligence level when I have to watch them. And I'm not going to buy anything from them until they fix it. We can do that. We have the power of the purse. Old Navy cannot compel me under the threat of imprisonment to buy their stuff. The government can. The government is force, and you must at every turn seek to limit its power and authority over you. You have to, folks. Because if not, we get things like Obamacare. We get wild and crazy promises about all of the great things that it's going to do for us and how it's going to change our lives and how it's going to improve everything about health care in America. And what do we find out? We find out that every single thing that we worried about is coming true. And it's just a matter of time before it gets far worse. Because as I've told you, the, the corporate mandate has not come into effect. Just wait. This is the tip of the iceberg. It is going to get so much worse. So much worse. And we need to fight at every turn to try and repeal it. Unfortunately, we've got Republicans in Congress who not only don't want to repeal it, they want to fund it. They're doing repeal after repeal after repeal vote. They'll come out and tell you when you talk to them about it, well, I voted to repeal it 40 times. I voted every single time to repeal it. Oh, well, what happened when the funding bill came up? Did you fund it? Well, oh, yeah, I did. Because they did. They, they made all of these like principled stands to repeal Obamacare when they knew it would never pass. But when it came time to fund it, 
and they risked a government shutdown, well, they'll, well, they just break down. Well, we just can't have that because we won't get reelected if they think that we're going to cause a shutdown. If you want to know how bad it is, we've actually got John Boehner right now. House Republican leaders are trying to sell a $174 billion Medicare vote. They're considering a vote next week on legislation that would abolish cuts to Medicare payments, a policy change that could cost upwards of $174 billion to enact. So they're trying to cut one of the ways, if I understand this correctly, and I believe I do, one of the ways that they got to a, uh, the number that they got to in, uh, in the uh, Obamacare law, of what it's going to cost to fund Obamacare, Obamacare, is they stripped out 100 or $500 million, or excuse me, $500 billion from Medicare and Medicaid. And now those cuts are starting to be enacted, and what's happening is around the United States, it is no longer profitable for doctors to see Medicare patients. They just don't get paid enough. And so they're filling up their, uh, their day seeing patients, and they're only getting a fraction of what they could be getting from another patient from Medicare. And so they're just simply saying, look, we're no longer going to take, if you have Medicare, that's great, but we're not going to take Medicare insurance. This, of course, is causing outrage from Medicare patients who think that they ought to be entitled to be seen. And now the federal government, the, the, Rep the Republicans, are coming out and trying to ensure that they can stop these cuts. So all the cuts that we thought were going to help pay for Obama, not only is Obamacare going to cost a trillion dollars more than they anticipated right now, just wait, that number, that number will go up too. But they're now also saying, oh, the cuts that we made to Medicare, no, 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 we need to add those back in. This is also something that I talked about and warned you was going to happen. I said, there's no way they're going to make those cuts to Medicare. No way. And sure enough, now they're going to try and bring $174 billion back in. Speaker Boehner and his leadership team are quietly coordinating a bill in hopes of ending the decade-long battle over how much doctors and health care providers should be paid for treating Medicare patients. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, without the profit motive involved in the insurance subsidy that's being provided, there's no way for the government to be able to tell what their premiums should be, how much they should be charging, and what, a, what the correct price for a doctor's visit should be. This is what happens when you try and get a government-subsidized program, is it's bloated, it's layered with bureaucracy, there's massive amounts of waste, fraud, and abuse, and there are hundreds of billions of dollars that are constantly needed in addition to what's already there, in order to be able to provide a substandard level of care. And instead of standing up again, instead of the, instead of the Republican Party standing up and saying, look, we're not going to, we can't do this. We can project out, we can look at what's going to happen in the future with Medicare and Medicaid payments, and it's not going to be long before it consumes half of our budgets. The promises that we made, we cannot possibly fulfill on, and it's time to make a change. We, it's better that we start now. And it's time that, Amer that Americans be told, and it's time that Congress come clean with the American people and say, what we promised you, we can't possibly provide. There's no way government can provide this. But that's not what they're going to do, because that's not what governments do. They'll continue to inflate the debt. They'll continue to take on more and more responsibility. They'll seek to retain more and more power and to strip more and more liberty from the people in the promise that they will provide them more and greater levels of security, which they cannot possibly provide. And then when it all comes to a head, when the entire thing is crashing down around them, the way that they will solve it is through inflating the currency. They will wipe out your savings. They will wipe out your future. They will wipe out the future of your children in order to pay for their bad decisions. That is the road that we are on, ladies and gentlemen. And if you want to fix it, you have to. it starts now. And that means all of you baby boomers out there 
saying, you know what? I know it's going to cost me more money. I may have to pick up a job because I didn't have enough saved. I may have extra expenses that come out, but we cannot have this Medicare and Medicaid program. It will crush us. It will crush my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, and I will not saddle them with that burden. And for those of you who are young, those of you who are in that 25-year-old to 30-year-old age bracket, those of you who are coming up in the world, who have been made all of these promises and have been told that you're entitled to this or that or the other, you've got to wake up as well and you've got to say, look, I can't, guarantee, I can't be responsible for that. I can't rely on Social Security. Social Security is not going to be there for me. And number two, it shouldn't be there for me. Because I don't think it's right that the wealthy and successful generation, the baby boomers, who have an average net worth of $174,000 or taxing me every single month at who makes $30,000 a year and doesn't have a penny to his name to pay for their retirement. That's not right. And it's not gonna, if it's not right today, it's not going to be right when I'm the one taking it from the next generation. And so it needs to stop now. And so rather than continuing to vote myself more and more money that belongs to someone else, I'm going to take a stand and say it stops now. I'm going to be responsible for my own life. I'm going to be responsible for my own retirement. I'm going to be responsible for finding and retaining my own job. And if I can't find one, then I'll start my own. And if the government bureaucracy and the regulation and the oversight is too great, then I'm going to stand up and fight to have it repealed. I'm going to stand on the side of liberty. I am going to stand with those who stand with liberty. You've got to make that decision. You've got to make that stand. Because if you don't, then we are lost. If you continue in the vein that your parents and your grandparents have taken us in, if you continue down that road, young people, it leads to disaster. It leads to statism. It leads to socialism. It leads to bread lines. And it leads to poverty. And we can't let that happen. Back after this. The truth about savings and consumption. We've all heard that consumption and spending grow the economy. Turns out that's wrong. In fact, the exact opposite is true. It's savings and production which make the economy grow, not consumption and spending. Here's a fact. Society wouldn't become wealthier if everyone just ran out and bought boats and houses and cars. If that were true, the larger everyone made their credit card debt, the wealthier we'd be. Something seems fishy. Think about it this way. A healthy economy is made up of goods and services people want. If we want to understand why some economies have a lot of goods and others few, we have to ask just how does the amount of goods in an economy grow? In one word, production. Let's look at a family farm. How much food they produce depends on how much they work. When they work, their total amount of food increases. When they eat, their total amount of food shrinks. This consumption isn't a bad thing. It's really the whole point of working in the first place. But if they want to sustain themselves, their production must outpace their consumption. What if they decide to build a plow to help increase their productivity? With a plow, they could produce twice as much in half the time. Well, plows don't just pop out of thin air. It takes time to make them. And while it's being constructed, those workers won't be producing any food. They'll just be consuming it. That means they'll need to save enough food beforehand to eat while they work. Without those savings, there's no way for them to take time to build a plow. They'd run out of food. Once it's finished, they can produce more efficiently and the total amount of goods will grow. On top of that, because they no longer have to worry about starving, time is freed up. They can now choose to produce other goods or services or just relax and enjoy their free time. And this is what happens in the large-scale economy. 
Factories and bulldozers don't just pop out of thin air either. They have to be constructed with a pool of savings as well. Here's how it works. In a free market, when people save their money and don't spend it, capital piles up in banks. In turn, this money is lent to entrepreneurs who use it to purchase or create equipment which expands their business and increases their level of production. And get this, the more goods that are being produced, the more savings that become available. As this pile of savings grows, even larger loans become available to even more entrepreneurs. This makes an economy grow exponentially. All of this is made possible only by savings. Without it, there wouldn't be any capital available to borrow. An economic expansion would come to a halt. An economy based on consumption and not production can only last until there are no more goods to consume. To learn more about sound economics, visit fee.org. Hello, I'm Ashley, a student at Hillsdale College. Here is my professor, Dr. Larry Arn, on natural rights versus entitlements. America was founded on the idea that human beings are born with natural rights, such as the rights to life, liberty, and property. A person who holds this view of rights makes no demands on others except that they respect those rights. Today, however, many Americans talk about rights to a college education, state-of-the-art medical care, and even birth control pills. These are rights understood as entitlements, and a person who holds this view of rights, far from making no demands on other people, is making claims on other people's money and resources. This understanding of rights not only sets citizens against each other, but it undermines the whole idea of natural rights. This Constitution Minute was brought to you by Hillsdale College. To join the national conversation on the Constitution, go to constitutionminute.org. Hey, did you miss part of the show today? Not to worry. Listen or watch the show live and on demand. Download the Jason Stapleton program app for iPhone and Android today. Join the conversation. Follow Jason on Twitter. And don't forget to visit the live show fan page on Facebook. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This is the Jason Stapleton program. Do you see this? Uh, this ninety-five-year-old man sets a new two hundred meter record. You see this guy? I've got to go to jasonstapleton.com unless you're watching the video version of this. The guy's ninety-five years old, and there's a video of him running the two hundred meters, and he's hauling. I mean, the guy's moving, and uh, apparently he's he won some sort of athletic competition for. Um, Oh, for the 200 meters, but he also set a world record for being 95 years. God, I hope I'm, I got to know what that guy's doing. Uh, he's probably taking HGH or something, but uh, who, who gives a rip? I'm just saying, whatever that guy's doing, I want to be doing that. But congratulations. His name is Charles e Egster. How do you, how do you pronounce that? E E U G S T E R. Uh, Eugster, but whatever it is, man, the guy's an animal. Mad props, my friend. All right, so Greece says, Greece is, Greece is out of money. Here To bring you up to speed on this, I know listeners of this show are very familiar with the Greece situation because we've been talking about it and, uh, and sharing with you some of, the, some of the same things that are happening in the U.S. that are happening in Greece and kind of the road that we're on. But new people listen to this show every day, so I, I have to go back and discuss it a little bit. But we have the, uh, the Greeks who have spent years telling their people they're entitled to certain things. They're entitled to re retired at age 52. They're entitled to all their health care being paid for. They're entitled to pensions. Uh, they're entitled to never be in want. They are pretty much entitled to everything. And what happened was when, they, when the financial crisis hit and they couldn't print money to support their economy, it came crashing down around them. And they had to, in order to save themselves from utter disaster, go and get loans from the European, from the Eurozone. Namely from Germany, because Germany is the backbone of the Eurozone, of the economic engine that is the European Union. 
And as a condition of that, they said, okay, well, we're going to give you this money, but if you're going to take this money, you've got to get involved in some austerity measures, meaning you've got to stop living so high on the hog. It would be an example. Think of it like this. A family comes to you, and they say, we are deeply in debt. We've made some bad decisions. Some of them are our fault. Some of them are just beyond our control, or so we believe. And I, we've got $10,000 worth of debt, and we can't pay our bills, and we're about to lose our home, and our kids are going to be out on the street, and we're going to be sleeping in our station wagon. Uh, please, can you help us? And you said to that family, you know what? Absolutely. That we believe that that's our responsibility to help our neighbor when they're in their need, and you've made some very bad decisions in your life. There's no doubt about that. But we have the money, and we are going to help you as a family. However, we want you to come over and let's lay out all of your bills. Let's look at everything that you're doing, and uh, and we're gonna you're gonna have to make some adjustments to make sure this doesn't happen again. They say okay, so they come over and they say okay. Well, here's the deal: you guys make sixty thousand dollars a year between the two of you, husband and wife. You're spending eighty thousand dollars a year. So here's what you're gonna have to do: um, no more pedicures. Uh, no more massages. You're going to stop getting your hair done every week. No more shopping. No new clothes. You're going to start shopping at the secondhand store. And we're going to get you underneath that $60,000 limit. And they say, okay, yeah, no, no problem. We'll do that. We'll do that. And, uh, but we really need to get some money for our bills because our mortgage payment is coming due. Say, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pay your mortgage payment. But then we want to see some of these things happen. We'll see you sell the stuff that we told you to sell and make the changes. And they say, okay, and they're so appreciative, and they leave, and it's great, and they get their mortgage payment, and then you come back to them the next month, and they say, hey, we need another mortgage payment. We've we're, you know, we got to pay these credit card bills. And you say, okay, show me your spending for this month. And you see that they didn't make any of the changes, none of them. What would you do? You'd say, well, well look, we're not going to continue to pay your mortgage and to pay your credit card bills when you are not changing your lifestyle. You're living way beyond your means, and we're not going to continue to fund this. And then the, whole, the, the other family says to you, well, you promised to do this. You said you were going to do it. You owe us. You said you were going to do it. We're not going to take this anymore. We're, we're done living by your rules. We're done living by your standard. We're going to do our own thing. But you need to keep paying us. That is what Greece has done to the Eurozone. That's what Greece is doing to Germany. It's just simply saying, look, we don't care. We're going to live however we want to live. We're going to spend as much money as we want to spend. We think it's draconian that you would tell us we can't get our hair and nails done. I mean, what are we, animals? We're not going to live like this. And Germany is essentially saying, well, you don't make the austerity measures, you're not getting the money. So now, because now Greece is in a pickle, because it has to have the money, it will literally be bankrupt if it doesn't get the money. And so the radical leftist Greek government insisted Tuesday that the debt-ridden country has never been fully compensated by Germany for its brutal World War II Nazi occupation linking the issue with Greece's fraught bailout negotiations. So since it cannot force Germany in the Eurozone to give them money, it is now going to take up reparations. Now let's talk about what happened back in 44. Reparations! In the 1940s, you guys came in and you destroyed our infrastructure and you destroyed our buildings, and we have never been fully compensated for that. Problem is, in 1960s, there was a reparations deal with Germany. But Traperas, who is the president, says that that of Greece did said that didn't even come close to covering the the costs that we were that we incurred from World War II. He goes on to say, um, Traperas told Parliament that Greek would honor its obligations to bail out creditors, meaning we're going we're gonna to fulfill our end of the bargain. We're going to take care of the creditors. We're going to bail them out with what? You've got no money. You have nothing. You're bankrupt. Your whole society will crumble without the help of someone else. Oh, we're, no, we'll meet our obligations, but won't abandon its irre 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 irrevocable demand that World War II reparations be paid. 
He goes on to say, we're not giving lessons in morality, but we will not accept lessons in morality either. He spoke these words during a debate of a sp- uh, to uh, revive a special parliamentary committee on demanding German war reparations. This is, a, this is a man without hope and without options. He's clinging, clinging to straws, just hoping, praying that something bites and he'll be able to go back and say, oh, oh yeah, we, we did it. We, uh, we got it. We got some money. We got some money. But the money's not there, folks. This is what happens. Eventually, you run out of other people's money. Greek ran out of its own money. He ran out of its people's money. It then turned to Germany into the Eurozone. It's now run out of their money. It has no other options. The best thing that the Eurozone can do is cut Greece off. If they do that, if they will cut Greece off, Greece will be forced to make the decisions. It will not have any choice. That is the only way. You know how you cure a junkie? Cold turkey. I remember being in the in the jail, and the worst kind of drug addicts you would get were alcoholics. Absolutely the worst. The worst detoxes that you saw were alcoholic detoxes. They were scary because they would have hallucinations, bouts, screaming fits. It was we had to have them in padded padded cells because they would hurt themselves. But the way you do it is you put them in the cell and you let them detox. The only way for Greece to detox off of its uh, addiction to other people's money is to ensure that they don't get anybody else's. And they can blame whoever they want to blame, but ultimately they're in the bed, they're in the grave that they dug. All right. So, Darren, how should we finish the show today? Should we talk about... I don't want to talk about the Nevada family. Oh, that's what I was about to say. Is that what you want to do? I got four minutes left in the show. Let me see what I can do with this. All right. Nevada family seeks law uh, seeks uh, uh, Nevada family seeks law change after being told they cannot raise foster children due to firearms. Mr. Wilson and his wife Valerie applied to become foster parents in 2013 after a three-month process, which included 10 weeks of parenting classes and multiple home study visits. The couple was told that they would be denied foster parent status because of their refusal to comply with the demand from the state. De- Uh, from the state's Department of Family Services that they not carry any weapon when foster children are present. So what the state has basically said is, if you choose to use your Second Amendment right to bear arms, your constitutional right, if you choose to exercise that right, you are unfit to take children. Doesn't matter what kind of family you are, doesn't matter what, you know, how much money you have, how much you really want and love kids. Nope. If you choose to exercise your Second Amendment right, you cannot have children. Now, let me present to you a scenario. What if someone said, if you choose to exercise your First Amendment right, your freedom to exercise your religion, because you have a Quran in your home, or because you have a Bible in your home, that you're not fit? to foster children because you know in the quran they say some pretty crazy stuff there's a lot of people out there that are being uh you know indoctrinated into this idea of radical jihad and we just can't have that it's for the safety of the children if you're a muslim you cannot foster children we heard in yesterday's story the uh christian conservative group they were labeled it was hate speech hate speech yep you christians out there you know what one of these children may end up being gay. It's an act of violence. And you may, with your religious beliefs, may, it may drive them to suicide. Your belief in, 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 in your, uh, you know, your faith. So you know what? If you've got a Bible in the home, if you take your kids to church on Sunday, uh, you know, we can't trust you guys to foster children. If anybody said that to them, there would be outrage. Yet no outrage when the Second Amendment comes up. No, no, no. You don't have the right to carry a gun to protect your family and the children that we're putting in in your care. No, 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 that should be reserved. That right should be reserved only to the state. You should have to give up your Second Amendment right 
to foster children. Meanwhile, we're just going to leave them in this, in the foster care system. We're just going to leave them in the system. I think it's just disgusting. And unfortunately, unless uh, unless the law gets changed, nothing's going to happen. But we're with you, Wilsons, and we hope that uh, we hope that it turns out well. And for the rest of you, I want to thank you very much for joining me. Don't leave yet. Don't leave. Because I want to ask you to do something. Number one, we had a huge outpouring of folks who came in and wrote reviews and uh, gave us uh, support on iTunes. And if you would be willing to go over and write a review on iTunes, I would truly appreciate it. Just Google, just go in the search and, and look for Jason Stapleton. The show pops up. And then always, the two things that you can do that are going to help this grow and become a success is number one, listen every single day. Listen to the show. It is incredible the the strides that you can make when you empower yourself with an hour a day of this show. And the second thing that I would ask you to do is to share the show with someone else. If you love this show, share it. Talk about it. Send an email out about it. Let other people know about what we're trying to do here. Until tomorrow, be safe and be good. I'll talk to you then.